Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 26 of Jordan and Drew, the sports crew. We have surpassed the one quarter mark to 100. We are at 26 episodes, and this is a big one here today. Our Labor Day special. We always love our little half an hour special episodes. This will be no different. Full disclosure, we're recording on September 2nd, Thursday night, off the heels of the Brewers and Giants game. We'll talk all about it. Not a good game to go out on, but we got screwed. And like I said, we'll talk about it more then. So I'm Jordan Lorenz. If you are indeed a new listener, thank you for listening to the podcast. Episode 26, as I said, we got a quite a huge back catalog of episodes to listen to. If you want to just catch up, I mean, it'll just be us talking about random sports that were timely at the time. Nothing wrong with that. You got a long car drive. Go ahead. Listen to an old random episode. I am joined by the one and only Drew Skyberg and Drew, you you, you were a part of a very special interview with Robbie Michael that we have up. Thank you, Robert Chimick, once again. I really was. It was a great interview. Robbie had some great answers, and I know you mentioned that as well. And it's always fun to talk some EWC sports with Mr. EWC Sports himself and Robert Chimick. So that was great. And we got a few more specials coming your way in the next few weeks. So just keep a lookout for that and just keep listening to these weekly episodes. Yeah, these are our bread and butter. We love doing them each and every week. All your favorite segments will be here today, including the shout out of the week. But before we get there, probably the biggest and most controversial shout out of the week ever. But before we get there, don't forget Instagram, Jordan Drew underscore sports crew, Facebook, Jordan and Drew the sports crew, YouTube, Jordan and Drew the sports crew. Your last episode with uh, Robert Chimmick did very well on YouTube. So thank you guys for listening to that. And don't forget, we are on Apple Podcasts as well. Hopefully most of you listen and follow us on there and leave those five-star reviews, a nice little written review. Very, very appreciated. So that's that. All the plugs have been completed. And it is time for our shout-out of the week, which goes to Bishop Sycamore. These guys, this is probably one of the wildest stories we've ever got to cover on the podcast. So for those of you who are unaware of what happened with this team. First of all, you must be living under a rock. Second of all, this was a height quotes here. I'm putting quotes, but you can't see them. A high school team that got on ESPN. So ESPN likes to air a few high school game once in a while. This was one of the featured high school games. However, it was realized during the game that this wasn't a real high school team. There was no website for this team. Their website was actually like a blog. So it really wasn't anything big at all. And the roster they were given, some players were missing. Players had the wrong positions. One of the players, number 54, who was hurt, he wasn't even listed on the roster. Bishop was down, I believe, 28 nothing in the first quarter. There was a lightning delay during the course of the game. They came back, wanted running clock. And Bishop's head coach said, no, we're not going to have a running clock. Bishop's head coach has an active arrest warrant out for them. So we're getting bad here. And all of their players are not from high school. Most of them indeed were dropouts and they were playing for this team. And they, I just, so there's a lot to unpack here that we still haven't even talked about. But first of all, I just want to say, one, Drew, how did this team get on ESPN? And two, what is the end goal? Because if they're trying to get their players recruited, recruiters are easily going to be able to figure out their age, figure out, First of all, this team isn't legit. Figure out they were dropping out. I just don't understand. Yeah, so I'm I'm awfully confused about that too because there are a number of ways they could have easily verified this information. There's a website called Rivals.com where you can um, check out high school athletes and the college recruiting process. And if they really had that, that a great number of D1 prospects that they said they had, this would have been easy, easily able to have been looked up. And obviously it wasn't. And also, if you would have searched on Max Preps, um, you got an ordinary page with a team's record and there was no official roster. So there's already, there should have been some questions there by this the people who um, thought, got this game. I, well, it was ESPN, but there was a marketing group or whatever that helped, helped arrange this event. And um, they obviously didn't take their thorough research. Yeah, like I said, there's so much to cover with this. Another thing I was thinking about, how are the announcers doing any prep for this game at all? Like, what are they possibly going off of? That's just the announcer and me thinking of that. But oh, and another thing, also, sorry, hate that I had to add this. Paragon Marketing Group should be ashamed of themselves, as they were the ones who were responsible for securing this matchup for ESPN. But I guess 
another thing is we really can't um, blame ESPN or can blame Paragon for everything considering ESPN still allowed this. Yeah. And I just also wanted to add, they also fired head coach Roy Johnson, the guy with the rest warrant on Tuesday. So he was, he was fired. So yes. And that's one other thing people were saying, imagine getting fired from a fake job and like this athletic director must have a lot of pull. He must be knowing exactly what he's doing to be able to get this team this far. There's another thing I saw one dude who was apparently on the team. He later quit. He talked about how the team would sleep on the floor of apartments together. So they'd all be in the same one, basically. And they were robbing Walmarts and Kroger's just so they could get food because coaches couldn't afford to feed them. So, I mean, we're getting bad here. And to make matters worse, this team played on Friday. And then that high school game that aired on ESPN was on Saturday. So everyone knows you need basically a week in between games. They played Friday and Sunday. And then afterwards, after everything was coming out, Four of their future opponents withdrew. They aren't going to end up playing them. So I think it's safe to say Bishop Sycamore, they're gone. I don't think we're ever going to see them again. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. It's a shame. Uh, it's, it's crazy how this happened. I'm really, really glad we got to see something like this happen in this day and age because I thought we'd never see a fake team make it to on a game like ESPN, like an ESPN, like high school events. This is awesome in the sense that, I mean, social media was just going off about this. Twitter, there's memes like crazy, but. Yeah, I, I don't think we'll ever see something like this happen again, though. So, no, I, I, definitely this, not. this is a lesson learned for Paragon Marketing Group and ESPN. It's certainly a wake up call to ESPN as well, because, like, who knows what else has been going on through the cracks in all these years. But this one came out, and man, it is just, I literally have no clue how they ended up getting this far and how they got on national television, especially modern day technology with the internet and everything. But who knows? We'll, we need a documentary on this. That's all I got to say. But now it is time for the stats of the week. Four of them, all baseball related here today. First one, Vladdy Guerrero Jr. had 38 home runs so far on the year. I don't know if he's hit another one since, but it's tied for the third most by a player at age 22 or younger before September in MLB history. Obviously, we know there aren't any Brewers near 38 home runs. Brewers do have a stat coming up soon. Next, Robbie Ray posts a new MLB record, 1,241 strikeouts over his first 1,000 innings. So he is averaging more than one strikeout per inning, which is fantastic work. Next, the Rays are the first team to have two calendar months with 21 or more wins in the same season since the 2002 Athletics drew. The Rays, I mean, wow, you want to talk about a hot team winning 21 or more games in a month and then to do it twice? Yeah, they compare very well to the Athletics team as well, considering, I mean, budget-wise, they both don't spend a lot of money. That was the Moneyball A's from 02, the Billy Bean A's. So I think those teams compare very alike and that's 19 years later as well yeah quite a while in our final stat of the week the brewers had a double digit division lead for the first time in a decade and only the second time in franchise history i mean that's a little hard to believe but wow double digit lead for the brewers we'll be talking about them here to come anything else are we moving on to on this day on this day it's labor day special Labor Day special September 6th is indeed the date here today, and we've got quite a few. It made up for last week where we didn't have the most. On this day in 1905, the Chicago White Sox pitched a no-hitter. Frank Smith no-hit the Detroit Tigers 15-0 win, so he certainly got some run support in that game. Next up, I love this one. On this day in 1945, the A's catcher, Greek George, punched an umpire, Joe Rue, and he gets suspended. What would they do nowadays if uh, not even just a catcher, but if anyone punched an umpire? I think they would try to like, I, I think you'd be gone for, I'd say like 40, 40 games at least. I think, I, I don't even know how long you'd be gone. It depends how, how severe the umpire gets injured. I think, I think that would, I don't know, maybe even half the year, I guess. I, yeah. The umpire, that's what I'm saying. Uh, hum, umpires association would probably push for half a year to a, like a year suspension. I think they would go that severe because, umpires like we're already losing like at any level you're losing officials you're losing umpires and i think one way to try to encourage people to come uh, be an official is to protect them and i think that this would this if that happened today i think there would be um i i don't even know what happened there'd be some precedent set then 
that would need to be set in order to ensure like I, these guys would and other people would be officials for the future to come. Yeah, and I think they would probably fine them as well. I think it's one of the big oh, upgrades, yes. especially money too nowadays, how much money they get. In 1945, they weren't making a whole lot of money to get fined, but now I think they'd put a nice hefty fine on there and a nice big suspension. Let's go one year later. On this day, 1946, the All-American Football Conference begins regular season play. Cleveland Browns beat the Miami Seahawks. That is a very interesting team. 44 to nothing, 60,135 people at Municipal Stadium in Cleveland for that game. On the sting, in 1954, the Yankees used a ret- record 10 pinch hitters. 10 pinch hitters in a game, Drew? That's some strategy right there. That's kind of bold. You know, they That's, playing matchups, maybe. I don't know what they were doing, but that is a lot of pinch hitters on a bomb. On the day 1963, Lee Allen, who is a historian, he says the Indians and Senators game is the 100,000th in Major League Baseball history. So I guess we just got to take his word on that. On the day 1980, the longest losing streak in college football ends as Malcolester College ends a 50-game losing streak. I've never even heard of them, but that's a lot of games to lose in a row. And finally, on the day 1995, Cal Ripken Jr., Breaks Gehrig's record, 2,131 straight games played in. Will we ever see anything like this again? No, I'm breaking. Oh, my. Not even close. I mean, 2,131 games. We're talking so many seasons of playing in every single game. So that is that. On this day has been wrapped up. It is now time for our weekly sports talk. Let's look no further that high school football, hopefully you liked my recap from last week that we booted in there. We're going to do one for Drew this week as well. But first, let's just go over some things real quick. As we said, we're recording Thursday night, so we're previewing a few games, I guess you could say. Manitowoc Lutheran is at Cedar Grove, Belgium. Cedar Grove, Belgium is a whopping 2-0 and on the year, and they won both of their games. 38-20 and 32-21. So Manitowoc Lutheran going to have to put a stop to Cedar Grove, Belgium. They're scoring a lot of points so far this year. Lincoln, they are at Sheboygan South. Sheboygan South, 0-2 on the year. They got shut out by Plymouth, 35-0, and lost to Nicolay, 42-13. Drew, I'm going to go ahead and say right here, ships are winning their first game of the year on Friday. Let's see what happens. I'm not a big ships fan, but I think they're due for a win, so let's see it. Absolutely. 0-2 start to the season. That very close loss to Appleton West. And then I wouldn't say pathetic performance against Appear last week, but certainly not their best work. EWC, week two, you want to talk about any of the games or we just want to jump to your recap? We talked about them on the Robert Schimmick episode that I did with him and Robbie Michaels. So let's go to my recap. Week three of the high school football season has now come to a close here. We got some games to recap. We're going to start in the EWC. First week of conference games has come to an end now as well with that. And all four of the games that were on the Eastern Wisconsin Conference slate, which was last night, we're recording Saturday here, all were blowouts. We'll get right into it. We're going to start with New Holstein and Ron Colley. New Holstein 36, Ron Colley 8. And for the wrong or for the new Holstein Huskies, their their bread and butter has been the running game all year so far, and that's exactly what it was here. Mason Buton yet again, nine attempts, 94 yards. Cody Obler, 14, 14 attempts for 64 yards. They finished with, as a team, 296 rushing yards. So that's been kind of how they've been beating teams up. No score in this game, first quarter. Both teams shut out each other, and then the second quarter. 28 points put up by the Huskies to go up 28 nothing at half, and it was all Huskies the way out except in the fourth quarter. We Braden Reimer with an 11-yard touchdown and rushing touchdown, and Jordan Lorenz actually predicted that they would score twice. They scored once, so he was close there in his bold predictions. And New Holstein moves to one and zero in conference. Ron Colley moves to zero and one. 0-3 overall, and New Holstein also, I got to include, and they moved to 2-1 and overall. So now to the next game, Chilton and Keel, and Robert and I talked about this game. We said it'd be a couple score game maybe. I I, I thought Keel was going to ha- just handle this game just fine, and they, they rightfully did so. Keel 42, Chilton 15 here. Keel 
was up 14-7 end of one. And then they score 20 unanswered in the second to go up 34 to seven at a half. And it was just all, all Raiders the way out. We actually have no stats for this game right now. So I can't really tell you how, how they scored those 42, but they put a four, big 42 points. And this kill team has looked very good so far to start the year. Three and overall, one and oh in conference. Chilton, however, 0-1, 0-3. But they, as we as Robert and I talked about, they had some low scoring games in their first two non-con games. But Chilton not looking good at 0-3. There are a lot of question marks with this team, but hopefully they can turn it around. So next game. Kohler, Sheboygan, Lutheran, Sheboygan, Christian versus Valders for Valders parents night, actually. So this game was at Valders and 49-0 is what the final was. KLC dominates start to finish here. They score in every quarter, 20, 15, 7, and 7 to make 49 points there. Valders shut out for the first time this year, but this was a great KLC team, as we know. So no, nobody should be hanging their heads for this defeat here. And yeah, it was all, all KLC the way the way out, start to finish. Robbie Michael, we talked about it. We had an interview with him. He had another phenomenal game here. 14 for 21 passing with 162 yards, three touchdowns. The, the ground game is where he really stood out. This KLC offense got 397 rushing yards throughout this game. And it was Robbie Michael and Matt Stefani who really did the work here. 20 attempts for 234 yards and one rushing touchdown for Robbie Michael. Matt Stefani, nine attempts, 127 yards with two touchdowns as well. And then the re receivers, we know who they are. Colin Gerdakis, Casey Verhagen, both had great games. Gerdakis, eight, eight receptions, 100 yards, two, two tutties. Casey Verhagen, three receptions, 40, 40 receiving yards, one touchdown there as well. And... Yeah, that was, that was for the KLC offense there, and we have nothing for Valders for their stats at the moment. But the final game we'll go is Brilliant Two Rivers. The game of the week is what Robert Schimmick and I dubbed it as, and it didn't really live up to the hype here. All Brilliant, start to finish, 41 nothing. Brilliant gets the dub. They shut out Two Rivers. Two Rivers was 2-0. and oh. Both teams were coming in with a, off great wins with Brilliant beating Wawiga Fremont, 33 zip, and then TR also being Brown Deer. So both teams were coming in hot. And yeah, this TR just couldn't get anything going here. Brilliant just handled it. They're up 21 nothing and a half. Then they scored an additional 20 points in the second half. And Sam Galoff had, had himself a game here. And he, going into it right now, 14 attempts, 86 yards. So at the average of six yards an attempt, but Three touchdowns for Sam Galoff, and that's great to see. They usually have a balanced rushing attack here. Garnet Stabani, 11 attempts, 55 yards, two touchdowns as well. And then Mitchell Kotarovic, seven attempts for 92 yards with one touchdown. So as we know, this is this team is, they like to run the ball, and the stats show it here. I mean, they threw the ball only twice. Mason Banky only had to throw twice here, and the rest of it was just running backs. You know, they, they have a really balanced attack with the running game, and that just truly showed. Jack Fisher also had an interception during this game, but we don't have any stats right now for TR. But what I did hear, I did hear Chase Mathias just had over 100 yards. So Jordan Lorenz's prediction this week, both of them were just short. So I know they're bold, but yeah, that, that was, he made some actual reasonable predictions. I mean, there's nothing that he could have. There could be people coming from other teams and just going in our comments like that's happened last week, but that's for the EWC there. So all four games, not really close, but certainly entertaining to say the least. And now we got to go to the FRCC South and talk some Manitowoc Ships football. And this game, 49-21 to 21 win for the Manitowoc Ships. We got no stats, sadly, for this game, but they beat Sheboygan South. They score seven tutties against Sheboygan South. And... They have not scored that this many points since September 30th, 2017. So Jordan would have been a little sophomore here in a 53 to 6 win over Sheboygan North. And I also got to credit him with that stat as well. Thank you, Jordan. But yeah, that, that's that's the football recap for this week. And we'll see you next week. 
All right. Beautiful job, Drew, with that recap. I was in Chicago. I really didn't have time, didn't have a microphone, wouldn't have had a professional setup at all. Thank you very much for filling in and doing that. Maybe we'll switch out. One week I do it, one week you do it, keep things fresh. I don't know. We'll have to figure it out, but it's a lot of fun now that we have high school football back and some of these games. Wow. I mean, that's all I can say about week three. So next up, Let's stay in the world of football. The Packers have finalized their roster. A few interesting decisions. I know some people would say, including the punter situation, we got rid of J.K. Scott. And people were saying that, I, first of all, like two years ago, I thought this dude was going to be one of the best. I mean, he was looking very, very good. And then all of a sudden, he just kind of, eh, he really didn't do anything at all. And now we have ourselves a new punter, Hunter, Hunter Bradley, right? Um, They actually made a trade then for... Corey oh, yeah, Borquez. This, yes, this is outdated. Yeah, very outdated because they traded, they made a trade then for a punter from the Rams because, I mean, he's competing with Johnny Hecker, so he's not going to win that spot. But he had a very, very impressive camp. And so the Packers, they need a punter, so they decided, hey, J.K. Scott, bye-bye. We're going to get Corey Borquez. And I'm, I think I'm saying it right. If I'm not, I apologize. Not. But I think that is one of the biggest takeaways from – the camp, the fifty, uh, the fifty-three man roster, and there are two more. I think Jordan, and I don't know if you agree with me on this. I think Kylan Hill being named running back number three, yeah, and also, RB3. yeah, I thought that was big. And also Malik Taylor. He, we talked about him last week. He had a big preseason performance in a few games, and he earned that final wide receiver slot. So good for him there. And I think those th- the, the three, those three things are the big takeaways. But I don't know. Do you have anything else on those guys? Yeah, no, I was going to say 100% agreed. They got to rid of quarterback Burkhart as well. And now we're stuck. Aaron Rodgers, Jordan Love. I mean, that's what's going to be. He's going to come back in camp once in a while, I guess, is what they're saying. So who knows? But I know some people are really high on Jordan Love, and some people are saying he didn't really impress too much. Where are you on the Jordan Love scale? I thought he had a pretty good camp. I think, um, he's, I mean, he's a work in progress. We knew that. So I think he, he showed some improvement. So I, I'm looking forward to as we know, that this odds are this is going to be the last dance. So he's got to be ready next year. So I, I am hoping that this this progress we see we keep seeing this his progression continue, and now we don't see a regression in him. Oh yeah, that's that would be terrible. I mean, if you've got two years under the system of Aaron Rodgers, you better come out having learned a lot of things and knowing what you're talking about and being able to back it up because otherwise, completely wasted experiment. And one of the big things, the Jordan Love draft pick. That was one of the big things that set Aaron Rodgers off last year. So running backs like we talked about. So Aaron Jones is RB1, obviously. And then we got Dylan as RB2. No more Jamal Williams. He's on the Lions this year. And Kylan Hill is our RB3. I think that's a solid setup. I really don't see any issues with this at all. I think we're going to be fine with our running backs because obviously we don't have to rely on them too much. But we know Aaron Jones is an absolute beast when we do have to go to him. And then the wide receivers to round things off. We've got Devontae Adams. Best wide receiver in the league. Marquez Valdez-Scantling, eh, you know, you never know what you're going to get with him. Al Lazard, Randall Cobb, he's back. He's wide receiver four. Then we got Amari Rodgers and Malik Taylor. Obviously, we got Tunyon as well for a tight end, but he can basically be a receiver if he wants to. I think, all in all, Packers have a fine little roster for themselves this year. The Randall Cobb edition will certainly help. And going into the regular season... I'm optimistic heading into the Saints game, which is now being played in Jacksonville. So that is very, very interesting. Any other Packer comments or are we moving on to some Brewers? I got to shout out my boy from Iowa, defensive lineman, Jack Heflin. He is an undrafted rookie and he made the Packers initial 53 man roster. So back to back years, they have an undrafted rookie make the roster. So congrats to him. A lot of hard work in that. And I hope I hope we can see him this year make some plays. You know, maybe obviously not gonna be starting, but we'll see him no. maybe come come in, make some, I don't know, just have have his presence in the game, you know. Yeah, you never know. We might be up fifty to zero one game and yeah. then we can throw him in. So that'll be awesome. Rod, Aaron Rodgers is gonna throw for seven touchdowns and Aaron Jones is gonna rush for three and then boom, we can put him in the game. So That is that for our Packers. Can't wait. We're gonna be talking all about them as the season gets underway. College football. We should mention as well, Ohio State and Minnesota are playing at the time of recording Badgers and Penn State coming up this Saturday, which will actually have happened by now. But the Ohio State-Minnesota score, as we are recording, 
Buckeyes winning 45-31. It was a lot less scoring than that one I just had it on, so that is a big development. Ohio State and Wisconsin likely going to face in the Big Ten Championship, you assume? Yeah, I, I think Wisconsin. If they come out of the Big Ten West, I hope they do. But Fingers I think, crossed. Yeah, you know, you never know, but Big Big Ten East, yeah, I, I would assume we see Ohio State again. No matter who their quarterback is, I think Ohio State, you know, football powerhouse. Yeah, exactly. It's no different than Alabama or any of those other schools. So now it is finally time for our Brewers talk. We're off a four-game series with the Giants. We went three and one in the series. You called it. You said we match up well against the Giants. They go three and one winning the series. Only reason they lose this last game. It was a 1-1 game, bottom of the eighth inning. Chris Bryant steals second base. Luke Maley throws it over to Willie Adamas, called him out. And then they review probably, I'm not even kidding when I say it was probably a three-minute review, and then they overturn it and call him safe. And then Devin Williams gets shaken up. He issues a walk, which is fine. You know, two outs now, runners on first and second. Boom, a double is hit. And then boom, a three-run shot makes it 5-1. Williams gets his second loss of the year, allows his first run since the end of June. He was the reliever of the month for the NL in August. He was on firing on all cylinders, as they say, but he just got caught in a bad situation here. Another ump show. He really did, and it was a sour taste at the end of the series, even though they took three out of four, but that call, you really couldn't tell from our angles, so I was I was surprised it got overturned because the rule usually is there needs to be clear and convincing evidence to overturn this call, to overturn the, the call in the field, and the call in the field is out, so I, we need clear and convincing evidence. Maybe New York, they had they had something we didn't have, but from what but we you saw, be showing us that if you do, yeah, I mean, you we, can't be leaving us in the dark. I, I totally agree. And we, what we saw, we didn't see anything clear and convincing. So the announcers, including people I watched the game with, were like, "Hey, I mean, it looks like there's there's not clear enough evidence. The dude's got to be out." But they overturned it, and then Devin, it just went down from there. Craig Council actually got ejected in the ninth because another ump show happened. Well, it was it was a foul ball. The, it was the correct call, but. Willie Adams had a long foul ball to the right, down the right field corner, and they called it a home run. And without giving the Brewers the opportunity to challenge it, um, the guys just get together and five seconds later just go foul ball. So it was like, just give the guy, like, just have it reviewed at least. That's what counsel was asking for. And he got, because that was the second time, and uh, he let him know a little bit, and then um, he got tossed. So that happened at the end of Thursday's game. But I thought overall, great series by the Milwaukee Brewers, Jordan. Fantastic. They win 3-1, 6-2, 5-2, and then lose 1-5. In the span of the first three games, only giving up five runs to the Giants, you really can't ask for anything better than that. And then putting up six runs and five runs? Yeah, I this this was great. Um, you had Burns going Monday, excellent. Woodruff Tuesday, excellent. Anderson injury, of course, but he did well in his two innings. Why does Open he get game. hurt in every other start? Well, this one, I, you can't blame him. He got hit with a 103-mile-per-hour liner to the shoulder. So this, yeah. like, it, that, that one was tough, but he always had, he's had blister history. He's had hamstring issues. He's just, his goal was 100 innings, and he's at, like, I believe, 88 and two-thirds. So he's, he's right around where the Brewers wanted him this year. And, I mean, he's, he's done okay when he's, he, he's been a solid fourth, fifth option. So... Because with injuries right now with Peralta, but Peralta will be back this week or last week, and he should be back. So that was great to see. And one more thing, Jordan, this ro- this Brewers team on the road, forty six and twenty four, they are one win away from tying the franchise record for road wins in a season, which was forty seven and thirty three in nineteen eighty two. So they're one win away, and we're just in September right now. Yeah, there's no way they don't get that record. It has been such a good season for this team. I would. I'm going to go on record right now and say anything but a World Series appearance is a disappointment. I'm not saying they have to win it, but I'm just saying at least make it to the World Series at this rate. With the way their pitching staff is going, with the way Yelich, we can't forget to talk about him, 10-game hitting streak, he has been doing fantastic. It seems like Yelly might be back. It's We have our little pieces, you know, where players seem to struggle and they're in a slump, but other than that, this Brewer team, I can't ask for any better. And then the Cardinals series... This past weekend, hopefully everything went well. You were at the game, what, on Saturday? Oh, you want to hear the games I was at? Yes. Friday, Saturday, Labor Day. So I was at three games this weekend with the Labor Day as well. So while you're listening to this, 
I might be at the Brewer game right now celebrating Labor Day. So it's a Brewer weekend, and I'm I'm down at UW Milwaukee. So it's right Milwaukee. You, you got I, I gotta yeah. It's 15 20 minutes out, and it's it's a must. You know when you when you're down in Milwaukee, you gotta go see Brewers. You gotta go cheer on the Bucks. You gotta go cheer on Patrick Baldwin Jr. That's so. a big one, certainly. And Marquette as well. Can't forget about them. Of course, thankfully, my team. thankfully they're in the Big East, so it's not like it's a rivalry with UW Milwaukee. You can cheer for them both, and it's really no big deal. I was at the Cubs game this past Saturday, Cubs and Pirates, so I got my first taste of Wrigley Field. There's that as well. And overall, Brewers Cardinals hopefully went well for this team. And now we look ahead to this week. Drew, it might, oh man, this is tough to say, but if the Brewers win the series against the Cardinals, our predictions challenge would be tie 10 to 10. So you came out with the biggest comeback anyone has ever seen in their entire life, and that is why you get to go first here in this upcoming week. We've got a three-game series against the right around 500 Phillies, and then a three-game series against, once again, right around the 500 Indians, soon to be Guardians. So six, seven, eight against the Phillies, and then 10, 11, 12, they get that off day on September 9th, one week from our recording, actually. So off day on Thursday for the Brewers, and then three games against the Indians. This is going to be an interesting week. I get to go first, you say? Yes, you do. I agree. It's going to be interesting. Interleague scares me with the AL Central. Brewers have sucked against the AL Central, but I say they handle the Indians. I go four and two. Okay. You like the nice, safe bet, and I don't blame you at all. I am going to go. So I'm going to go down. I'm going to go three and three for the sole reason of I just don't know what's going to happen in any of these matches. Phillies could easily go either way in my opinion I think they probably win two against the Indians and then there's a potential they could sweep the Phillies I don't think it'll happen there's also potential they could somewhat get swept by the Phillies so I'm going with the latter I'm gonna go a nice three and three 500 week for this Brewers team and who knows what's gonna happen this predictions challenge is absolutely wild so any other notes to wrap up Brewers Packers college high school anything else no, it's our Labor Day special. We got to keep it short and sweet. Yeah, we do. But we have trivia as well. That's right. I threw in part two of the Horizon League trivia. So this one's got some true or false. It's got some options. And the last one is tough. But we're going to see how you can do here in our first question. So last week, if you missed the podcast, Drew had to name five teams in the Horizon League. He named three. So this question might be a little tricky for him. True or false? There are 12 teams in the Horizon League. I'm going to say false. It is actually true. There are indeed 12 teams in the Horizon League. So a nice little 0-1 start. But our next question should be easy enough to get you back on track. The Horizon League headquarters is located where? Chicago? Do you know without me giving options? No, keep going. Okay. Chicago, Detroit, or Indianapolis? Chicago? It is actually Indianapolis where the headquarters is located. So this is not too hot of a start here in trivia season three. However, Horizon League knowledge, yeah, I mean, you're, you're brand new to all this. So this is expected. Yeah. Next question. True or false? Notre Dame used to be in the Horizon League conference. False. It is true. Notre Dame was in it for two different periods, from 1982 to 1986, and from 1987 to 1985. So, I mean, way, well before our time. However, we got two more questions left to try and get you on the board. Have you ever gone 0 for 5? No. I don't think you... Did you in mascots at all? I don't, no, I don't think so. I think I always got one. Yeah, I think you did too, because I always kind of threw an easy one in there. Next question. Which active team has been with the Horizon League the longest? Was it Detroit Mercy, Wright State, or UW Milwaukee? Um, I'm going to go Detroit. Detroit Mercy, that is your answer? Yeah. And that is correct. They have been with the Horizon League since 1980. The final two, 1994. So... You got that one right. Beautiful job. We'll at least get a one out of five 
here this week. And now the final question. So this is going to be kind of similar to last week's in a way. I need you to name the team colors for Youngstown State. So there are two colors and you get one strike. Red. Red is a team color. Now one more color. Okay, I think I... White? It is red and yeah, white. Yeah, okay. Wow. I, I actually, I, I thought about it. I've seen a banner of, the, of their state, of the... Yeah. Yeah, so it, I, that's what I was thinking. If you can just think of like the banners. When I was mm -hmm. at UW Green Bay announcing, they had all the banners like that. Beautiful. Red and white is indeed the correct answer. Two out of five. You really turned it around at the end. The final questions are supposed to be the toughest, but somehow you got those ones right. The, yeah, the earlier ones were the toughest for me. I don't know. I like. I don't know why. It was weird because I, I don't. I I wonder where the headquarters are. That was kind of like my. See, I actually it, thought that was the easiest one out of. I, bunch, I had no idea where the headquarters were. I figured I yeah. thought the Big Ten headquarters were in Indianapolis because that's where the. That's where they play. Yeah, that's why I thought the Big Ten. So I was like, oh, maybe it's it can't be Indianapolis. Then I thought that was where. But oh well, so, two out of five. So I'll just, take it. I just Googled the Big Ten headquarters. It is in Rosemont, Illinois. I did oh, not know that. I I didn't know that either. I thought I thought that well, was... Well, actually, don't they play basketball at the United Center? I don't know, dude. I don't know. I feel like they do, and that kind of makes sense in that regard. But at the end of the day, 2 of 5 will take it. 6 of 10 so far to start trivia. There is plenty more coming up that you will get to get. Just real quick, to remind the fans, if they didn't last, last week... All-time NFL statistics, MLB MVP winners, grab bag on defunct teams, college bowl games, 2021, 2022. So those are coming up. And then base or basketball video games prior to 2000. Those are our categories. They'll be put on the wheel next week, and we will spin it around for episode 27. That wraps up our Labor Day special, our nice short and sweet edition of the podcast. We actually kept it rather short this week, so I am proud of us for that. Drew, you can shout yourself out to wrap this thing up. Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, you know the drill, Drew Skyberg, D-R-A-W-S-K-Y-B-E-R-G. -E Thank you once again for that EWC recap in our episode. Beautiful stuff. And don't forget, follow the podcast, Instagram, Jordan Drew underscore sports crew, Facebook, Jordan Drew the sports crew, YouTube, Jordan Drew the sports crew. Follow us on Apple Podcasts. Leave those five-star reviews. I'm on Twitter, Jordan Law underscore PXP. Coming up here on the this Thursday, actually, I will be at the Timber Rattlers game. It's like business of sport night or something they're doing some whole campaign and you get to go before the game take a tour do this meet people should be fun 10th this friday i'll be announcing the ships game color commentary with damon ryan and probably someone else as well and i got a big week coming up very very busy as we get going here but thank you all for listening to episode 26 of jordan and drew the sports crew the perfect podcast for you